I'm telling you, leading indicators of inflation internationally have turned up. Right. And so and, later and, on, and you're day, saying his, history suggests they should turn up anyways too because that's cyclical. anyway. Regardless of whether or not we're right about a specific forecast, inflation cyclical. If we're in a free market oriented economy, and uh, I think we are. I think the really big backdrop there is post GFC. We had low inflation. Mm-hmm. And it allowed a policy of QE to come in, yep. even when rates were low. ZERP and NERP, and then you could do this quantitative easing and liquidity, which you started the call with. Uh, and in an inflationary environment, that playbook is a tough one to to run. I don't, I don't, you know, it's it's. I'm I'm curious as to how you run QE with inflation. Uh, and maybe that's going to be what we have to um, experience to see how does that work. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. The real money in investing is made by those who perceive what the markets are likely to do tomorrow and then position themselves today to profit from that future action. Today's guest, Lakshman Achuthan, co-founded the Economic Cycle Research Institute specifically to identify these key turning points for investors. Which key turning points are in play right now and how can we best take advantage of them? Well, let's find out by asking the man himself. Lakshman, thanks so much for joining us today. Wonderful to be here again, thank you. Hey, it's such a pleasure. Really enjoyed our um, our first interview together last year. Um, really actually, feel terrible that it's taken this long to get you back on because I, I, I follow your work and I'm, I'm uh, always wondering what you're thinking. So I'm so glad we're able to make it happen early here in 2024. Um, lots of questions for you. I mean, in many ways, I sort of want to pick up where we left off, uh, you know, a little over uh, almost a year ago. Um, but mm-hmm. of course, it's an entirely new year now. So I'm um, looking forward to what you're seeing ahead but also Mm -hmm. maybe doing a little Monday morning quarterbacking of what happened in 2023, because there were a lot of surprises Mm -hmm. there for folks. Um, Before we get to the specifics of that, though, can we just start at the high level question? I like to kick these discussions off with what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Uh, For global economy, I think it's a a bit of a mixed bag. There are some regions uh, where I actually see some green shoots. I know it's been a while. Uh, and uh, there is some uh, cyclical firming. There are others, uh, including the U.S., uh, where some of the cyclical impulses still, um, even even with the 2023 that we had, still uh, to the downside. Uh, and separate from growth, um, there's inflation. Uh, that's another key cycle for us to be tracking. And uh, that is a bit of a mixed bag, although a little bit more leaning toward um, an inflation cycle trough globally. Uh, and so that's, I don't think, on anyone's bingo card just yet. Uh, and I think that'll be something that'll that'll be more of the discussion uh, later on this year. Um, so that's the economy and inflation cycles, very big picture. Uh, for the markets, kind of priced for perfection. I mean, every day is uh, moving around a lot, but uh, kind of priced for perfection um, that the soft landing or no landing uh, is taking hold and uh, that somehow inflation will come down to uh, the Fed's target and kind of hang out there. Uh, And so it's hard to improve on that outlook. Uh, and so our job, as you mentioned at the outset, and, and really what we're focused on is, is number one, cycles, and number two, what's the risk of a turn? And so uh, there are some uh, turning point risks in 2024, uh, I think, um, that we have to keep an eye on, and that that's really what I'm, I'm focused on. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to dig into those turning point risks. Um, very quickly, though, before we get to them, for folks that didn't see our previous interview, could you just spend a minute or two kind of grounding the audience in your economic cycles research? Like just describe the framework and how you use it. Yeah, at a, at a high level, I think the most interesting thing is um, that we are not using uh, econometric models. We're not modeling the economy. And I think a lot of people 
do use uh, econometric models or different types of models to forecast uh, where will growth be, what will the jobs number be, uh, what's inflation doing. Uh, and um, this is not, I, I have to make a bit of a broad statement, but modeling tends to extrapolate recent trends. And that's a perfectly good way of thinking about the world. Uh, and um, oftentimes that works. Uh, the place where it is reliably going to mess up and fail is around a cycle turning point. Because if you think about it, if you're extrapolating something and it turns, you're going to make a mistake either right. on the bottom or the top. And so the way that the tool, so that's not a great tool for turning points. Uh, econometric models, extrapolating, not great approaches uh, for catching turning points. So what we're focused on are so-called leading indicators of turning points. That's different than a leading indicator of something all the time. I'm very interested in this moment of inflection in growth to the upside or to the downside. And there, uh, we we have been studying for decades now. Uh, I'm the third generation of this research, by the way, and I'm getting old. <laughs> but this is uh, this is, we're looking at the sequence of events that occur at cycle peaks and troughs in whatever the target is. It might be growth, it might be inflation, it could be a specific major sector of the economy, um, things like that. And um, in in doing that, there are some long leading indicators, short leading indicators that will break the trend and turn and go the other way ahead of the target. And the target could be something uh, for, for viewers, the target would be GDP, industrial production, retail sales, uh, manufacturing and trade sales, earnings, income, uh, those employment. kind of the employment. These are all coincident measures of the economy. So we're trying to look ahead to see if there's an inflection rather than see what those have done and extrapolate it into the future. So that's the big divergence between what we're talking about today and what you might talk about with someone who's running a big macro model. All right. Um, so that is, uh, that's super fascinating to me. Mm. Um, I mean, we all know the market largely, uh, you know, is a herd driven uh, system, right? Yeah. So when the herd is all, all stampeding in one direction, right? You're the guy who's out there saying, okay, you know, um, how do we know if there's a cliff coming up, right? So I need to look yeah. for the, the 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 details that show that the road ahead might might actually be very different than what the herd is assuming, right? So you're looking for these indicators that will hopefully give you early warning that there's a turning point ahead. Right. Okay. And, and presumably 100%. you said you, you said you're you're sort of a third generation torchbearer for this study. So this is this is actually like a, a field of study that has been curated and and, and you guys are still, I guess- We used to be the mainstream. You know, the, I mean, literally this stuff used to be the mainstream. So if you go back to Wesley Mitchell, it's a hundred and something, it's a, in the in the teens and the in the roaring twenties, the 1920s, okay? There's a lot of uh, activity in the economy and in the markets, right? And a wide ranging debate as to what was going on. And then one of the first things that, that our group had to do was bring some order to the debate by defining what the economy was. And, and so Mitchell did this by identifying periods of recession, contraction, and periods of expansion. And the way that he got to that was let me look at output, employment, income, and sales, not individually. I'm not going to cherry pick them for whatever I want it to be saying, but collectively, let me put them together and see how they move in concert. That's where we get recessions and recoveries from. That's where that is rooted in. And so um, uh, Mitchell did a lot of work on what is a recession or a recovery. Um, Moore, his, uh, his protege, my mentor, Jeffrey Moore, right? Jeffrey Moore, Jeffrey H. Moore. There's a there's a couple Jeffrey Moores. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey H. Moore, Jeffrey Hoyt Moore, who um, was uh, head of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and he was uh, BLS commissioner and things like that. So he said, "Okay, now we know 
this this ocean that we're swimming in in a free market there's an ebb and a flow it's cyclical and we know we can extrapolate growth and inflation in between the turns we kind of know how to do that but what about those turns that seems like a really big problem that's where he spent all his time and that was the beginning of leading indicators and now uh today we've got probably i don't know 15 16 really interesting leading indicators for the u.s economy and about i don't know a handful or so for all the major market economies around the world 22 economies and so these many cycles, I got to tell you, it's a bit confusing <laughs> and I try to boil it down uh, and, and, I, and it should be able to boil it down, right? It's directional. Is it up or down? But we do have a lot of cross currents. I think that explains a lot of what's going on in 2023 where us and others, but definitely us, we expected there to be uh, a more obvious hard landing in 2023. Uh, and uh, so far that, that, that didn't present itself. All right. Well, let's let's talk about what your indicators. You know, I sort of see your role here as the mm -hmm. the pilot in the cockpit. You've got zillions of different gauges there that are telling you all sorts of different things. Yep. So you're using that information, but your job is relatively simple, which is to give your passengers a safe flight and get them where they yeah. want to go. Right. Yeah. So um, so let's let's talk about in a minute what your gauges are telling you for the road ahead. But let's dig into this in 2023, because you're certainly not alone, Lakshman. I would say, you know, the vast majority of people that I talked to last year, especially at the beginning of the year, you know, everybody was was extremely confident that a recession was coming. I kind of already referring to 2023 as the year of the recession that wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are the main reasons why? you think it didn't happen. And I've, I've had some people on the channel recently suggesting certain culprits. I'm sure it's multifactorial. Uh, liquidity is one of the culprit names that comes up a lot, but I'm curious mm -hmm. from your, your, you know, we're still early on, but your forensic look back at 2023, yeah. what happened when your indicators were saying, hey, we should be worried about a turning point, yet the turning point didn't happen, at least not yet. Right, so the drivers of the economy, the cyclical drivers that, um, underlie and anticipate kind of directional moves in the economy those are all recessionary and uh, we can go into it but they were all recessionary mm -hmm. and that's why we and, had the, the classic regular leading indicators like yeah inverted yield curves and the lei chart and all that. i mean all that stuff was at recessionary levels all year long basically correct correct uh and may still be <laughs> yeah. and uh and um so, so those are leading indicators. Now you switch to coincident indicators to say, has a recession begun, right? The leader is supposed to tip you off one way or the other. The coincident, yeah. this is the one that, that's the, the ref. This is like, was the ball in or out? Where is it, right? And that's, again, that's output, employment, income, and sales. And I think um, you can... You can get into a situation where it's it's very tempting, obviously, to talk your book and to pick the indicators uh, that that um, fit your story. And so if you want to be super bullish, you're like, oh, well, GDP was hot in third quarter and uh, jobs growth has been positive. So come on. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to uh, share with you, if I if I may. um a chart of the coincident index please do and and so what that coincident index um shows um is the path of those four measures of economic growth and here it's for the last four years um so gdp is in there jobs are in there sales and income are in there. And you see kind of crazy numbers, right? So we we come out of COVID and we hit practically a 20% growth rate in these indicators, right? The collective objective. There's no forecast here. This is simply uh, adding up the indicators that define expansion and contraction. It's just these reporting, here, yep. Yeah, we're just reporting. And then you see here the indicators, um, the, the the growth rate comes down quite a bit. 
think the lowest spot we saw was in 2022, um, where it was just about a 1% growth rate. Uh, and the highest spot we've seen since then uh, was about two and a quarter percent, the 2.2 percent toward the third quarter of uh, 23. Um, but this is very different from kind of this blowout gangbusters economy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I as, as a non-expert in your uh -huh. craft looking at this, it, it just the word that comes to mind is anemic. Well, yeah. So now, so look, it is what it is. This is this is the score of the game, okay? And and so when when uh, someone says there wasn't a recession in twenty twenty three, this is this is the evidence, right here. Um, but uh, it's hard for me to say, hey, we're going gangbusters or we're accelerating, uh, based on any of this data here, okay? And this is again, output, employment, income, and sales and so what happened this is not a recession so what happened why wasn't there um a recession is 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 the is the kind of follow-on question and here i'd say all the cyclical stuff was recessionary so what's the non-cyclical stuff that's at play and the number one item is uh very very tight labor supply OK, so a lot has been written uh, about why um, we had tight labor supply. Uh, there was, you know, even pre-COVID, there was uh, uh, a sharp reduction in legal immigration. Uh, and then and then with COVID, you lost uh, different cohorts of people from the labor force. And so it was mm -hmm. tight. OK, so labor hoarding is really um, apparent in the behavior of business managers where they would um, rather than let people go as demand slows uh, do everything else they could possibly do right um, and and so you've seen the the work week come down uh, you've seen um, I actually have a interesting chart on that one which which i should share with you too uh the work week coming down is quite uh dramatic because it it's at levels we actually haven't seen since covid this is um including data the last data point this piece here is a move down that we got on friday and the last time we saw something this week in the work week is uh during covid and and you could see some earlier recessions here's the great recession it gets quite a bit weaker yeah but you could see in the 01 recession this is right around in there and in the 90 recession it was quite a bit higher the work week it was longer so this is you you see managers rather than firing people right so you see jobless claims kind of hanging in they're not spiking at at this point just yet yeah. But rather than doing that, we're going to what what other levers can we pull right. in terms of they're keeping them um, on the workforce. Yeah. They're just using them less. Right. Using them less. And and that 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 gets. So another component on on uh, jobs that we should just be aware of that's You know, interesting to note is that the jobs growth that we have, and this is, again, uh, fully updated and, and you have recessions the the light the light kind of teal line those are that's jobs growth in education and health and that is just doing fine um in 2023 it's running around a four percent growth rate that is i mean almost as good as you would want in 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 in, in a sector um but when you when you look at the rest of the jobs market now we're down to a 1% growth rate. Wow. And um, that's pretty telling. This is the more... So the reason I'm, I have it this way is education, healthcare, non-discretionary. You know, if you're, if you're like uh, on a certain level, you got to go to school and you got to go to the doctor, right? So, so it's non-discretionary 
uh, consumption. Um, but the other kinds of things, which were extremely strong jobs growth in more discretionary areas of the economy, um, they were very, very strong. And they've come from very, very high readings here uh, down to just about 1%. So what's also interesting to note is you see this kind of gap opening up, this jaws mm -hmm. opening up. Look, that kind of happens in front of recessions. There's a gap in front of COVID. There's a gap in front of the Great yeah. Recession. Yeah. Here's a little bit of a gap showing up in front of uh, the 01 recession. And this is a little different here, but there is a gap uh, presenting in front of the 90 recession. So, you know, this kind of stuff is showing us lots of cyclical push to the downside. It's being offset by super tight labor supply. I think the Inflation Reductions Act and, and the CHIPS Act, a lot of targeted, targeted spending. You spoke a little bit about liquidity. So some huge um, government spending uh, mm -hmm. coming out. Uh, and we even, you know, that kind of hits towards the end of 2022 and really gets going in 2023, um, resulting in kind of a weird situation where you have you know, the typical pattern of deficits, government spending and stuff is that it ramps up and plugs a hole during a recession. Maybe even after a recession has just ended. Mm -hmm. And here, that whole thing is happening before a recession. We're, we're front loading it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's a really <laughs> weird thing. You don't see that a lot. Uh, and and that is part of the backdrop that we're living in, where you have this big, big, big government push um, when there wasn't a recession uh, before it, and we'll see we'll see what happens. Uh, okay. It does suggest if there is a recession anytime soon that you know the deficits really do blow out. Okay, and I, I so totally want to dig into that, and and you know Jerome Powell's mm -hmm. surprise dovish comments. Are, are making people ask a similar question, which is, whoa, why, why are we starting to planning on easing when the economy is doing, quote unquote, pretty well, looking at these, you know, non-cyclical data and, and the headline numbers that get reported pretty frequently. Um, but before we get into all that, I, I, I want to ask just a couple of questions about the jobs. Um, first off, the the chart you just showed us about declining, that was declining growth in job openings, right? Is, is, is that, yeah. that right? Uh, um, no, 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 that was, I, that was, excuse me. I showed you one on the work week. Yep. To get and then the second, second and one. the second one was, uh, jobs created in health and education compared to jobs created everywhere else. X. Yeah. So, uh, so, and, and it's, it's growth in jobs creation, right? Yeah. Okay. Gro jobs so, growth. Yeah. Yeah. So we're seeing declining growth right now. And my question is, 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 is that one of your leading indicators that you look at, right? Where, when job growth starts declining, is that like, okay, that's that's increasing the potential yeah. that we could enter a point where job growth goes negative and then recession? No, you know, it's not It's likely. not a leading indicator. That's a coincident data. It's a great point. That 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 falls into my kind of coincident. Okay, instead of real time. It, yeah. Yeah. So what, what typically, the reason you typically see that pattern of education and health stronger and everything else weaker going into recession is because... Um, the, you're tightening your belt where you can, and you're not where it's essential, right? Yeah, yeah. You could you could have you, there's a lot of interesting patterns, right? So, the service sector may not contract in a recession. It has in a couple of recent recessions, but if you take the long view, like a century or something, you, you don't see that happen. It's it's very the recessions are um, at their core driven by the goods sector, which is construction manufacturing and that kind of stuff which has the the cycles in those sectors of the economy are many many times larger than cycles in the services front facing services sector and sorry and to interrupt so you but, the but jobs I'm remembering losses are bigger yeah and i'm remembering a comment you made in our last um in our last discussion which is even though the economy is the percentage of manufacturing contr contribution to the economy is lower today than it was say a generation ago it has a much higher 
um, like a multiplier effect than the services side. Is that true? Am I remembering that correctly? Well, well, so the output, our output's not bad, right? Our, our goods output, manufacturing and, and, and uh, uh, construction and goods output is pretty darn good. We're doing it with less people, as you can imagine, because there's more automation and, and, and so on and so forth. Although there's an interesting factoid there. Um, but what happens is job losses during recessions. So a recession will require output and employment to go negative. So to get the negative employment growth, you actually typically lose uh, kind of the lion's share of jobs out of construction, out of manufacturing, yeah. which is really interesting because, right, in 2023, rates go up. Nobody wants to really buy a house. Uh, where are the construction guys going to work? They all worked, a lot of them. I mean, and I'm talking national numbers now. Uh, they all slid over to the uh, non-residential construction area where there was huge amounts of money going Fiscal into factories. spending going yeah. into it, right? Exactly, yeah. Back, you were going to, let's build some battery factories and other factories. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, kind of targeted uh, building going on. And so non-residential construction, I mean, dare I say, commercial real estate. You know? mm -hmm. uh, this was booming in terms of job needing to hire people, even though all this other weird stuff is happening. You know that some of those commercial enterprises are not that viable right now. Oh, yeah, there's a high. lot of commercial okay. real estate that's in big trouble right now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. but by dint of all this fiscal spending, which then multiplies with some private spending deals, you get these huge factories and other things being built. It just sucks up all those construction workers who would have otherwise lost their jobs and you would have seen weaker jobs growth. Yeah. And uh, so that's a non-cyclical pushback that is not sustainable. See, this is when I say non-cyclical, I'm saying this stuff isn't sustainable. These are one-offs. Yeah. Stimmy checks were one-offs. You know, the CHIPS Act is, as far as I know, a one-off, right? Um, I guess I, I just, I, I caution myself to never underestimate the ability of the government to do something stunning in terms of spending. Yeah. But so far, I, I don't see anything immediately on the table. So, gosh, a couple of questions about this. Um, first off, uh, I don't want to get too into the weeds on this, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, is this... Um, what do you think this is driven more by, um, hey, we learned our lesson during COVID that our, our supply chains were too brittle and too dependent upon foreign entities, and, and this is just a national priority? Um, is it, hey, we see things starting to slow, and, and we, we don't want a bunch of construction workers out of work sending us in a recession, let's keep them busy? Um, or is it, hey, we got an election coming up in November, you know, we don't want to go into a recession. Let's keep things going until then. There's elements of all of that, I think, yeah. in play here. I think all of that is in play. If 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 you if you leave it to the kind of the free market side of it, as a business, um, you you know, strictly speaking, you ought to protect your ability to product produce, uh, and you want to minimize your cost and increase your quality. So. Um, if onshoring does some of those things in the world, when you, when you do your, you know, five-year look ahead or whatever, uh, I'm sure that's happening. Now it doesn't hurt if the government pops up and says, Hey, we'll subsidize that. Uh, you're, why not? Right. You'll take it because they'll give it to somebody else if you don't take it. Right. Um, so all of that is there. I, and the election stuff. Sure, but our, our indicators are really just objective. They don't they don't get in or gauge um, that we're in an election cycle or not, or who might be doing what. Uh, it's rather uh, what is the impact on productivity growth, um, rates, uh, uh, profits growth, uh, the key things that ought to drive risk-taking investment uh and things like that and so that's what are in our in our forward-looking data which is which are cycling down see that's the that's kind of the elephant in the room right yeah they're still cycling they're still cycling down here all right and again i want to get to looking through all your forward yeah. data in a yeah. second just just to wrap up this part um so uh 
I've heard from a number of people uh, that who I've interviewed recently that, um, hey, the, the 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 funds that are being pushed into the system from the fiscal side, you know, mm-hmm. on the Inflation Reduction Act and and mm-hmm. you know all this domestic spending, like that <clears throat> that tidal wave is just starting. Like, in fact, they've had issues up till now finding enough shovel ready projects to fund. The money is there. Actually getting it out and getting spent has been the constraint. So, you know, I believe you're saying that this was one factor that sort of cushioned things artificially in 2023, pushing off maybe the arrival of a recession. Could it continue to do that for the foreseeable future? I mean, if, if, yeah, if the, yeah, the wave is still coming in. I think we're hearing similar things right that they couldn't the shovel ready stuff wasn't there the money's still there right and some of these uh, there is allotted and so it's one of those things where hey there's some money in the budget if we don't spend it something's going to happen to it yeah. right and so it start and there and there is even some inklings of trying to get that push that out to states and stuff and state and local governments so that they have it to plug some holes so i suspect some of that will happen um, so we have more of the what what we've called the tug of war between the cyclical downside and the non-cyclical upside. It is elongated. I'm not sure it's over yet. I can't say that all that money's been spent. I don't know that, right? So let's just stipulate that it hasn't and it will continue to trickle out. The thing is, um, is there more? Um, I'm reminded of uh, Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland, where the Red Queen uh, uh, points out that you have to run twice as fast just to stay in place. So can that be accelerated? Or is it a step up and then we're there? So very specifically, I'm going to answer my own question, right? So non-residential, <laughs> non-residential construction growth, okay? Not forecasting. So this is a very narrow slice of the U.S. economy. Most yep. of us don't do this stuff, okay? But in this part of the economy, it's cycling down, following the leading indicators of that sector. Then uh, you hit the uh, the Chips Act, and it's like you know, towards the end of twenty twenty two, it just goes bank, and it's like hockey stick to the upside, just moonshot, okay? Now the level of that has kind of gone flat. Mm-hmm which may be just continuing to feed out like we were just describing. Yep. But the growth rate of that is now decelerating. Yes, the impulse. Okay. Yeah, so down. that's where we're that's where we're at right now. So unless there's some new slug introduced, I think that's we're in the the waning part of that. Got it. So even if we even if we cruise at the same altitude for a while, that actually sort of like the looking glass that that actually is is something that's pulling down over time as the growth rate goes yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so but again we have this tug of war going on. Now, the cyclical has been pulling pretty darn hard. The non-cyclical has been pulling really hard to the other side. If the non-cyclical loses a bit, it can it can it can fall. That's what we're monitoring right now. We don't know the answer to that. All right. <laughs> but, that's, but, but that is what you're monitoring. So let's go into that. The, the, the other question I was going to ask, and maybe I'll just ask it and get a, a super quick answer unless it's yeah. worth exploding more. I do remember last time we talked, <laughs> when we were talking about employment, you were quite concerned about the decline in productivity. And mm. when you were showing the decline in hours worked, I don't know exactly how they calculate productivity, but I'm guessing hours worked is a variable in there. Mm-hmm. Is, is the productivity situation, has it improved at all since we last talked, or is that still something you've got a lot of concerns about? Uh, it it improves it improved quarter to quarter. Yeah, sure. There's been a spike back up uh, in productivity, but the trends over several quarters, let alone years, are horrific. Horrific. Okay. Horrific. They're just bad. And... And they're particularly bad uh, in construction. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I mean, I know they're busy, uh, but there's uh, it takes two people to do the work that that one construction worker did in the mm. '90s. That's that's rough. I I feel for the business managers here and and for the workers. Look, everybody's under pressure, and there's it's not. It doesn't mean that the people are not as good as they were in the nineties, although there may be some skill mismatch right now. Mm-hmm. You got to 
you know, the experienced people have retired. Um, there's more regulation. There's other kinds of things that are in there that are slowing things down. Um, but uh, if you're running a business and trying to be profitable and you got to have two people to do the work that you would have had one do, that's going to squeeze your margins. Yep. Okay. So in labor hoarding world where you're freaked out that you can't hire someone, uh, now you got a tug of war. So you lower their hours as one way of holding on to people because you don't want to lose the worker, even though your margins are squeezed. But at some point, uh, you're going to have to let them go if the profits aren't there. And that's where I wanted to go here. So you, you came right to the question I was going to ask you at the end of this whole jobs thing here, which is, um, you, you were talking about how companies have been job hoarding. And I think to date, they've sort of been hoping the Fed's going to come to the rescue. Um, we just get a last up to the point where the Fed starts bringing the cost of capital down again, juicing right. the economy a bit, and then we'll be through this. I, I think the housing market is is has been telling itself the same story too. We, we just get to hang in here mm -hmm. until the Fed brings rates down again, and then affordability will go back up and we'll be fine again. Yep. What are your forward indicators telling you is more likely? Will, will we be able to get into that nirvana? Or is this more a period where uh, you just have more and more, you know, the systems in stasis, but it's getting increasing pressure and then crack. You know, they're like, look, the, it, the Fed's not right into rescue in time. I got to start shedding some costs here. I, look, we may be wrong, but we think that uh, there's going to be a lot of difficulty for the Fed to do what it plans to do uh, in the absence of a recession. Okay, so... What do I mean by all of that, right? So so if we just put growth on hold for a sec, so we we saw the indicators of growth, they came down low, they're kind of bouncing, a lot, languishing down there. And we described the tug of war of the cyclical versus non-cyclical. So growth is doing that. Now, inflation has been cycling down, uh, which is totally consistent with what our inflation indicators are saying. That's, that's all good. Um, but... Uh, the forecast seems to be that based on, say, the last half a year of inflation coming down, that if we extend that, we're going to get to the Fed's target, and then we're going to stay there, and then the Fed can bring the cost of cop capital down, and we'll all be saved. Right. This is the, the butterfly soft landing that, that our wizards at the Fed engineer, hopefully. Yeah, so that's kind of the plan, as it were, right now. <laughs> And um, the problem with that is that, uh, number one, inflation doesn't really hang out at a level. It's cyclical. It kind of goes down and goes up and goes down and mm -hmm. goes up. And so here we're in this downswing. And uh, I don't know how long that's going to go on. I'm suspicious that it won't go on as long as needed. And the reason I'm suspicious about that is because of, uh, first, one thing is in this century, and you wouldn't know this unless you really looked at cycles and to the exclusion of other stuff, but in this century, international inflation cycles have been largely synchronized, meaning that upswings and downswings and say the US and Europe and Asia and some of the BRICS and whatever have been kind of going together. Pretty correlated. Pretty correlated. So they kind of, they don't get out of sync. They're kind of all moving roughly together. And um, basically everywhere except the US, our forward-looking indicators of inflation have gone up. So that has us on alert, right? We're cycle turning point people. That has us on alert for the global inflation cycle bottom um, in, in this year. Now, uh, if you if you write that down and then check against all the central bank plans, <laughs> all the central bank plans are that sooner or later, yeah, they can they can kind of uh, start to become easier. They can pivot. Yep. Uh, if it's the ECB or if it's the U.S. or whomever. Uh, and, uh, 
those two things like one of those is going to happen and one of those is going to run into trouble i don't know which one uh i i do think these indicators of direction are pretty good uh, of international inflation cycles that we're watching and then in the u.s uh our future inflation gauge has come down right it hasn't turned back up uh but the difficulty is that it's gone sideways for the better part of a year it hasn't turned up hmm but, it but it's hasn't, not going it, down anymore. It's not going down. And, uh, you know, we we were, you know, out in front on some of this sticky inflation stuff. And when we're when you dig in there, the the holdout. Is wage inflation. Um, again, you circle back to what's going on in the economy. Yep. And, and sorry, when you say it's the holdout, it, it's the holdout to the upside. Right. Hold out to the downside. Like so. So the future inflation gauge comes down. Inflation is right. coming down. Headline inflation is coming down. Core inflation is coming down. OK, now the future inflation gauge has come down, but it's gone sideways for the better part of a year. It's kind of uh, these mean these numbers are meaningless, but I'll give you a sense. It's between yep. 111, 113 all year. It's kind of bouncing along. Yeah. And that it, tells us, hey, this big thrust to the downside that everybody's hoping for, it's not there. Right. And so there's, we were talking. There's, there's some resistance that's preventing it from being. Something's under there. Something's right. under. We've landed. And is that up. because wage inflation is there pushing up? Among other things. Okay, and that's uh, what I meant by the like, upside. But okay. Yeah. yeah. So wages. So so um, you you could look at things like the Atlanta Fed does has a wage tracker, and I think it topped out in the high sixes. It was like six seven or something last year. Okay. Now it's like the low fives, but it stopped falling. You know, it came down to like five, three, five, two, and it's kind of like going this way for several months. It's pretty sticky. Look at all. I mean, you can read the headlines. People are going on strike. They're saying, I want more pay. Uh, they're, they have leverage because of that tight labor supply and the labor hoarding. Right. So this is a component in there uh, that is, uh, you know, it's a very kind of tired word, but it's sticky. Right. And, and. Powell knows this. And the one way to get that number down is to have job losses. Right. Okay. It's very hard if if jobs are growing uh at the at a strong clip to get that number down. And um so there's these this cognitive dissonance that you have in kind of what's being said. Hey, the unemployment rate's going to go up to four something. That's recessionary. Okay. Uh, wage prices, wage inflation is going to come down. Well, that kind of means you need a weaker economy. Yep. Um, but a lot of other kind of businesses or cost structures, if it's real estate or wherever else, are really banking on rates coming down. And... Um, that gives us uh, a lot of pause. We we threw up a chart, um, I don't know, a week or so ago, and it got a lot of um, attention. And I'm sharing it with you now. And so what you're looking at is um, there's the notorious 1970s. That's mm -hmm. the dark line. And that's CPI inflation from the late 60s to the early 80s. And that's what happened. It 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 started off pretty low. It was around two and a half percent. It cycled up to a high of six something percent, cycled down to three-ish, cycled up to twelve-ish, down to five-ish, up to almost fifteen, down below three, right? This is what inflation cycles. That's a good this is a good good snapshot of the fact that inflation cyclical very different economy i'm not arguing that we're in the economy we were in then i'm simply making the point that inflation is cyclical so now in the 2000s it's the gray line you get low inflation uh in the early part of the 2020s this is uh starting in 2020 here then uh it runs way up that's the inflation cycle upturn and the fed says uh you know they were slow on the on on on, on reacting to this yep. right uh 
And so it reaches a high of something, I don't know, 9% ish, it looks like there. And now it's come down to uh, a little below four. Okay. But so inflation cyclical. We see again in the 2020s, here's an inflation cycle, right? Yeah. Um, oh, just to be, just to what, be clear, inflation you're saying historically has been cyclical. I think the market's expectations that is that inflation is coming down here to two, and it's going to flatline going forward. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, we could ask our kids. Like, let's say we drew a dotted line across here, saying it's going to flatline, and we could ask them if they thought that was likely, <laughs> if they understood a little bit of the chart. I mean, it's not likely. It's just not the way a free market works and i think this is conceptually very difficult for uh an econometric model to handle what the model's doing is extrapolating this trend to the downside and um hoping that it continues i'm telling you leading indicators of inflation internationally have turned up Right. And so and, later and, on, and you're saying his, history suggests they should turn up anyways, too, because that's cyclical. anyway, regardless of whether or not we're right about a specific forecast, inflation cyclical, if we're in a free market oriented economy. And uh, I think we are. Um, and here, so the thing that we're looking at is cyclical. What I think from the Fed's point of view, right, let's say they're I'm putting words in their mouth, but they're saying mission accomplished. I just want to show you where mission accomplished is on this chart of the 70s. This is not mission accomplished. This is not mission accomplished. This is mission accomplished. And this happened after Volcker crushed the economy. Right. That required a lot of pain. <laughs> yeah. And so the risk, I think... And maybe I'm being a worry wart, but just looking at cycles, the risk is that you get higher lo higher lows in the inflation cycle. If we start seeing higher lows in the inflation cycle, then it's going to require something um, pretty drastic. And this red line, just so uh, uh, listeners or, or viewers can, can can see, is that that's the average for the period. It's just about seven percent. Mm -hmm. Uh, the high is up here in the in the teens, and the low is uh, around three. Hmm. So we could have a good argument as to whether the current economy could handle seven percent, given how much more debt there is in the system today. But that's a different. That's, see, this is a real. Time. So so a real question. I started uh, nineteen ninety recession. <laughs> and so and so that's bush senior and bill clinton young bill clinton coming in right yep and uh and i remember it was a you know it was an interesting recession and uh and clinton got a lot of um traction feeling people's pain he knew there was something going on there was a lot of job losses and he kind of made a connection on that mm -hmm. now he then had all of these grand ideas of what he was going to do. And he ran into the bond market vigilantes and they said, no, no, no. And they jacked those rates up so fast. They were like, you're going to spend. And they jacked the rates up and they kept them from spending that administration from spending uh, the way that they wanted to. Jim Carville was like famously said, Hey, I don't want to get, be reincarnated as the president. I want to come back as a bond market. Bond market yeah. They have more power. Now <clears throat> let's see what happens now. W you know, are, you know, with an inflationary backdrop, how far can you push spending? And remember that's critical to this non-cyclical pushback. Yeah, that's coming on top of the tight labor supply. So that's a really kind of different view from a cyclical vantage point than the headline narrative. Yeah, and and we've had some some experts on this program, Lakshman, who have as much gray in their hair, if not more, <laughs> than you, um, <laughs> who have said <clears throat> their concern here is that eventually, given current trajectories and where things are headed. 
the bond market is going to step in, 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 in the words of uh, Bill Fleckenstein, mm -hmm. it's going to take the printing press away from the Fed. It, um, but, but I think his, his point was even larger, which, you know, and, and by that nature, compromise the fiscal spending uh, ability of, of Congress, too, over time. So, but let's not, I mean, to be fair, right, I, I want to say that the cyclical stuff was recessionary since last year. Mm -hmm. And there was um, such an enormous non-cyclical kind of one-off pushback, which gives us deficit spending like we typically see in a recession before a recession. Uh, that is this tug of war that's going on right now. And business managers are seeing price sensitivity from their customers, right? Because just because the pace of inflation comes down doesn't mean the price fell. Right. So we're all sitting here going, whoa, things are 20%, 25% higher than they were two years ago or something. Right. <laughs> we, we, we still have the injury. Yeah, it hasn't healed <laughs> yeah, at all. Yeah. We're still like, we're still suffering from this thing. Interestingly, I mean, I've been told, right? I wasn't paying this cl close attention that in the 70s, during this kind of inflationary 70s, in the early part, people weren't that freaked out. They were like, yeah, you know, we got jobs, you know, we other things are going on. I'm, I'm, I feel okay. It was later in in that it started to be kill inflation now. Yeah. It wasn't early on. So Burns, who was the Fed chair early on in the yeah. 70s, he he didn't have the political cover right. to fight inflation. Right. Volker. No, and, Vol and Volcker, you know, folks forget that Volcker uh he actually pivoted once yeah, and, it, yeah. and, and, and it was only after that, that he had the air cover from the administration. And at that point, the American public as well to say, look, do what you got to do. You know, we've, we've tried to avoid this every way we can. It's not working. So, okay, let's take the really painful medicine now. Right. And human nature may be that we have to go through the whole decade of this again. I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll see. It's so interesting because Powell, Powell has referred to Arthur Burns. He's referred a lot more to yep. Booker, but but it, in it's setting the context of I don't want to be an Arthur Burns, right? That's why mm -hmm. I think he surprised so many of us. And I, I don't want to speak for you, but but a lot of the folks that I talked to have been surprised because they're not shocked that a Fed, you know, chair, you know, pivoted his 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 framework, uh, you know, unexpectedly, that's happened many times. But but the fact here that Powell has been trying to wrap himself in the cloak of Boker and said, you know, repeatedly said, look, I'm happy to err on the side of tightening too much because I know how to fix that. Um, this was sort of a surprise because it's getting people like you saying, well, you know, there's not like a zero chance here of an Arthur Burns scenario. And you're even saying, given the indicators you look at and the historical cycles you look at, it's like, there's a decent case to be made that inflation is going to go higher again. So why would you start easing now, right? Why would you not wait until it's clear you've done your job? So maybe they, maybe he knows something we don't know. It, meaning There's he's always worried that. about something? Maybe. Yeah. You know, I don't know, right? I don't know what I don't know. So so maybe he knows something we don't know about um, some of, you know, what is it, Warren Buffett's thing, you know, who's when the tide goes down, naked, yeah. naked, right? And maybe he's seen something that he didn't like. And uh, he's like, whoa. Um, but personally, but, my money is on that, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I think it really, you know, the tire is going to hit the road for business managers when their profits growth uh, doesn't add up to what they're paying out for all their employees that they've been hanging on to. There are companies where this is not that big of an issue. And those may be the magnificent seven, so to speak, right? Where you can uh, do a lot with tech and not as many people. Um, but on that, on that people heavy, people facing services stuff that's discretionary, that's a very tough business to be running uh, when people become price sensitive. And, and I think that's what's happening. Uh, so we'll see when, and so when you see the, that chart that we, we threw up earlier with the non- education and health jobs growth coming from very healthy levels well you know six something percent below one percent that's material that's meaningful 
All right. Well, look, in, in, in starting to wrap up here, and I hate to have to start to wrap up here because I have so many questions we didn't get to, but I've got to be respectful <laughs> of your time. Um, there's sort of two big things that I'm taking from this discussion so far, Lakshman, which is you're saying, look, um, we are in this interim period where we have these these cross current cross current forces duking it out, cyclical, non cyclical, you know, economic cycles versus potentially one off, you know, interventions going on, and we got to see how that's going to shake out. Right. Looking at the impulse that you were talking about, the actual decelerating growth of the non cyclical side of things, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Correct them if you want to, but it, I, I get the sense that you're thinking if you had to bet right now on that battle, cyclical would win out over non cyclical unless something new is announced right some other massive big spending scenario for the, for the u.s i think that's a real risk okay for the united states correct for the united states um <clears throat> all right so um uh uh um in terms of like what you're looking at ahead the two mm -hmm. things i took were where you see the risks are there's risk to the downside for growth mm -hmm. especially, if what... there's a sh especially if there's a shock by the way so, um, you know, vulnerability, if you're, if you're kind of slowing already and you get a shock, that's a, not a combo you want. Right. And, and presumably if you're, you're slowing already. It's almost like your immune system getting compromised. Like you're correct. You're more vulnerable to shocks that happen. hundred percent. hundred percent. You got it. Okay, great. And then the second thing I heard you say was there's a risk to the upside on inflation, which is that inflation may likely go back up it's 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 already seems to have made the turn in, in many other parts of the world and if the historic correlation between the us and the rest of the world continues to hold and if inflation is just cyclical like the way your historical studies show that it it, it is uh that in, inflation may surprise the system to the upside here so everybody who is counting on this immaculate disinflation of the fed where they bring everything back down to 2% and it just stays below 2% going forward from here and happy days are here again and rates come down. You're saying you're seeing, you know, a degree of risk that says I wouldn't put all your chips on that bet. Yeah. And I think, I think there's an opportunity for that notion to get further embedded, right? Because I'm looking at cycles. I'm looking at a couple quarters. Um, next couple of reads of inflation could be to the downside. You tell me what the market's going to do with that. They're going to go to town, right? They're going to continue <laughs> they're to gonna, party. They're going to they're going to party like there's like it's 1999 or whatever. They're going to go crazy on this, and uh, and so that has to be part of what you're navigating here, right? So so again, I'm I'm risk man cycle risk management. I totally get it. The CPI can come down for a couple more readings. That's not the interesting story. The interesting story is that someone who's banking on it going down for several quarters or, or through the end of the year and the Fed really being able uh, to kind of do whatever they expect them to do, that could get toppled over. And that'll right. be a reset. That'll be an right. interesting reset. Well, and this is, this is why I have such respect and interest in what you do is Look, I think the odds are probably pretty good that we're still going to see some inflation readings to the downside here in the near term. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of people on the channel um, saying like, hey, looking at the short term indicators, everything's flashing green. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we've even had some some, you know, veteran, highly respected macro guys uh, like Felix Zuloff, who mm -hmm. have said, yeah, I expect actually the markets to just, you know, have a great time uh, through mm -hmm. Q1, power higher, right? But as many people have said, looking at history, you know, the markets tend to party the hardest right before you smack into a recession, right? And this is why turning points are so great, right? So if, if the market is, is seeing data in the short term that makes it think, okay, game on, everybody in the pool, you know, if you look at the percentage of retail uh, funds that are in the market now, retail investors are fully invested. That's usually a mm -hmm. sign that Patsy has arrived at the poker table, right? The game's going to be ending soon. So <laughs> having indicators like yours that say, hey, everybody, whoa, wait a minute, like don't get caught up in the euphoria because we may be seeing a turning a turning point here and you'd want to make sure that you're not stampeding off the cliff with the rest of everybody. Yep. No, I, I, 
I agree with all that. I I, I want to make the take some of the cycle stuff and, and make a slightly different observation too. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you know, there's a soft landing, no landing, or a recession. These are three different, or a hard landing, whatever you want to call it. And and if it if it's harder, um, you got to do deficit spending. <laughs> now, if you have to do deficit spending when there's inflation, that what's going to happen? It's like pouring kerosene um, on the inflation, right? Well, it's going to be messy, right? So now what do I want to do, right? You, you've you got to figure out your bond, like which financial assets do are going to inflate well in that environment. Maybe it is the Magnificent Seven. I, you know, I, I'm not going to actually judge that one. You, I mean, you do want to navigate around what happens when the bond vigilantes are coming and you still have to borrow money. Right, that gets a little yeah, tricky. That is a little <laughs> that tricky. Gets a little tricky. So, so those are some of the things we're we're kind of looking at. I think right now, though, on growth, tug of war is in full effect, uh, and so we need to see which way it's going to break uh, in twenty twenty four. All right. Well, so you've right. you've opened the door to the last big question I wanted to ask you here, um, which obviously is kind of you know how you would be thinking of navigating this current environment, right? So we, we have a market where the animal spirits are running wild. They might mm -hmm. even run a little more crazy in the short term. Um, like, are there assets that you you favor for this type of uncertain year here? Are there ones that you think, obviously you think inflation is going to come back up. Uh, you're, you're probably not as sanguine on bonds as some of the, the big bond bulls right now who are thinking, okay, the Fed is just going to raise rates, you know, back to two percent or lower and we're all going to be great right yeah i'm a little you're, you're right on that point i'm a little more suspicious there uh and i and i and i i do have to prepare for like i said some downside risk on growth uh but in a weird way it's a topsy-turvy world sometimes the there there are aspects of uh financial assets that'll do well in that mm -hmm. right i do i do want uh some inflation protection i think conceptually uh in 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 right. in what i would be in for that what tips gold where commodities in general what do you what, what yeah do you maybe even commodities commodities are, commodities are pretty beat up <laughs> right i mean i mean they you know i think oil's down again today and and so so some of these things are pretty darn beat up and uh you know if the if we get more clarity on uh on inflation bottoming in 2024, mm -hmm. probably not a bad uh, place to be. To be. Uh, so, I mean, that's, you can't put all your assets there, right? That's just a little right. piece, but um, that's, that may, may be an opportunity there. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's so kind green of, shoots, I, by the way, I, I mentioned green shoots at the beginning in, in Europe. <laughs> we didn't even talk and, about it. And I, so I saw, <laughs> I see there's a little bit of cyclical construction stuff in Europe. Uh, Maybe even uh, 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 in in Asia, we'll see. We're watching that closely, but so, the U.S. it's not there yet. It's not there. So at, at this point, you know, would you be telling people to kind of look at adding some international exposure? I think in in some specific areas, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, I think I'd start to, you know, in twenty twenty four, I'd consider uh, some of the eurozone stuff and maybe even. Maybe even China, though it's messy. There's structurally a lot of problems, but cyclically mm -hmm. it may bottom. Um, what I'm kind of taking from what you're saying, Lakshman, too, is like, um, you know, leading up to COVID, we'll say, um, and even through 2021, to be honest, because the stimulus, I'll, I'll continue this. That was like the easy button era, right? Where right. If, if you were an investor, just buy the index and ride it. You know, buy anything and ride it practically, right? And buy the dips, right? Um, so passive investing worked great. Um, it sounds to me like you're saying we're entering an era where we're going to have to be much more active investing, at least in kind of the year ahead from what you're telling me, especially if inflation proves to be cyclical, where, you know, we've got cross currents, but we've also got these major trends that are going to be reversing on us at different times. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, I think, I'm convinced inflation is cyclical, but but uh, you know others may debate that. Now the I think the really big backdrop there is post GFC. 
we had low inflation. Mm -hmm. And it allowed a policy of QE to come in. Yeah. Even when rates were low, ZERP and NERP, and then you could do this quantitative easing and liquidity, which you started the call with. Uh, and in an inflationary environment, that playbook is a tough one to to run. I don't, I don't, you know, it's it's I'm I'm curious as to how you run QE with inflation. Uh, and maybe that's going to be what we have to um, experience to see how does that work. You know, there's a lot of, I think there was uh, one of the central, one of the FOMC people, uh, Logan was out starting to talk about the reverse repos and the runoff and what's going on with QE and QT. I think that that discussion is probably going to come a little more to the fore uh, where they're like, how do we keep rates high, but maybe give some liquidity? What are we doing? Because that quantitative tightening has been going on too. Yep. And um, the last thing you would want is for inflation to trough in 2024. And from a risk management perspective, that has come onto our radar screen, at least mm -hmm. internationally. And domestically in the United States, you got to look at wage stuff and it's tight wage inflation, which is a real issue for the Fed. So that's where the, your risk is because you can't go back. Everybody who wants to go back to the way it was, or we're off to the races. It's going to be fine. <laughs> you you need low inflation, and um, that, that would require China exporting disinflation all over the place for a decade. And they're right. not about to do that. <laughs> we don't have, we don't have <laughs> someone who can do that this time around. Yeah, exactly. No. Um, it sounds sort of like you're saying <clears throat> the choices are increasingly <clears throat> between fire and ice, where it's mm. like, you know what, we uh, we 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 ease and then we risk um, we risk uh, you know inflation troughing and, and going back up, or if we don't want that, then we really have to crack the jobs market. We've got to make it not tight, and if we do, then we cr then we cause the recession, right? So yeah, which, yeah. yeah. It, well, you know what you're really now you're making me really step back because when you were asking me about the QE stuff and and the and the you, you now you're making me step take and I'm going to take another step back. Yep. I only step back a decade. Now I'm going to step back a couple <laughs> decades, and I'm going to say, um, what's weird is that recession is synonymous with Armageddon. See, I'm, I was just about to make this point, so please go. I, I, I'm glad it's you did. It's just not. It's the it's a way natural it's part going. of a business cycle, right? <laughs> yeah, it's totally natural, and it's it's horrible because there's collateral damage to vulnerable members of society, right? If you if you you know if you if you are vulnerable, you're going to get tagged in a recession, and there's just no two ways about it. I wish that wasn't the case. But it's the way the world, as far as we know, for the last couple of centuries has worked. And trying to forestall a recession, you get into this weird world that we've been in, kind of Alice in Wonderland world of QE and 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 uh, modern monetary theory. Remember that one was from a couple of years ago and, and how we could print money in order to just keep things going because there was no inflation. Um, all of that uh, is in service of avoiding a recession because the Great Recession freaked out, you know, the mm -hmm. establishment essentially, right? Generals and, fight the last <laughs> war, right? We don't want that again. Yep. And there's like by hook or by crook, we that's an Armageddon. They were talking about depression then. It was a recession. They're acting like this is just the end of the world. We've survived, and I've said this before, we've survived 48 of them in the United States and we'll survive the 49th. But there's a there's a very cathartic process that occurs. It, it clears out the less productive parts. It sets you up for your next phase of growth. You need it. So the more we do a lot of shenanigans to avoid it, we may it, it may be ultimately counterproductive. Right. And you've heard the whole forest fire analogy, right? You know, yeah. if, if you don't do the controlled burns, by yeah. the time when it inevitably happens, the destruction is way bigger than it should have been, right? Yeah. And the you know, I mean, I don't know that much about fire, but, you know, I'm not sure how much you can control it. You try. Right. <laughs> you right. But you're making try. the same analogy by, by doing everything yeah. we can to have it always be endless summer in the economy. Once the yeah. winter of recession arrives, Correct. inevitably, it's going to be worse. Yeah. And look, it'll be 
you know, one, you know, when the recessions are over, those are wonderful periods. And in recessions, by the way, I want to point out, in recessions, you actually have really neat things get created. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. You a lot of interesting th things come out of yeah. that tough moment. That's why they call it creative destruction, right? You get exactly. rid of the now investment exactly. and you replace it with all sorts of great innovation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and from an investing standpoint, while a lot of you know market value gets wiped out because it was invested in mm -hmm. the, the now investment, you get some phenomenal investing opportunities at the trough of the the investing cycle. There, right? Well. Well, in fact, you could argue, right, the, the, the free market actually requires the recession because it is the risk that makes you, that, 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 that pushes you towards a better investment, right? You need that, if, if you're not, if, if something is riskless, you know, you get kind of lazy. Uh, but if there's some, if you've got skin in the game, you can get hurt, you're really thinking it through. Um, and so when they're, you know, when the, when the Fed put isn't there is 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 when uh, people uh, get pretty sharp. Oh, God. Great discussion. Um, <laughs> I, I, I it, it's bothering me that we we've tapped this vein right at the very end here. So well, we can, we, we'll do it again. I was going to say, when you come back, <laughs> on, we'll, we'll, we'll start at this. Um, all right. Look, well, uh, two remaining questions for you. Mm -hmm. The second one is going to be what's a non money related investment that you would encourage people to consider investing or, or at least adopting in their lives. Um, I'll ask you that in just a second. You can think about it. Um, much more important question though, which is for people who have enjoyed this discussion, maybe this is their first time getting exposure to you, Lakshman, where can they go to follow you and your work? Well, I would go, uh, I think businesscycle.com. That's our website, our home base, and, and you can find out a lot of things there. We we publish a lot of charts and columns and whatnot. And also, you could follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Economic Cycle Research Institute. And there's a, a newsletter there we put out uh, that, that kind of uh, captures all the stuff we're saying publicly on a regular basis. And follow us that way. That's probably the easiest. All right, great. Um, Lakshman, when I, when I edit yeah. this, I will put up the URLs to your your website and your LinkedIn here on the screen. Folks will also put right. links in the description below the video too, so you can get there with one click. Um, yeah. All right, well, look, um, Lachman, always yeah. a joy. Um, so much more to dig into. We have you on here next. Um, yeah. Just to wrap it up, um, what is a non-money related investment that you think is, you know, again, you know, wise for folks to consider adopting? Wise for folks. I, I have so many. I, I was just going to say sleep. <laughs> it's yeah, great. That's a great one. Actually. I think that's a great, that's what I'm working on. Um, I got kids, so it's a little bit of a challenge, but uh, uh, I get there every once in a while. I try to be more flexible in my thinking. Uh, how could I be wrong? Um, I try to be more flexible in my body. Stretching is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that's given me the biggest dividends outside of investing is community. So it could be community with people that I'm working with and talking to. I, I am cherishing, you know, deeper relationships as opposed to uh, quantity of them. Let me put it that way. All right. Uh, great answer. I, I have talked a ton about exactly that on this channel recently. So I'm not oh, really? going to bother folks Perfect. by opining on top of it, but couldn't agree more. Real quick, <clears throat> um, I have written in the past previous businesses I've done on functional health, like the key tenets of functional health. And what's interesting is, you know, some of them you would you would think about automatically, right? So, um, you know, functional fitness, you know, exercise, mm -hmm. that's obviously big and important. Um, nutrition, huge, way bigger than most folks realize, but huge. But two other elements of that, or three, there are three other elements. One is stress management, right? Um, the fourth, though, is sleep hygiene. And that's probably the one that at least Americans, on average, are the worst in out of all these. Uh, and the fifth is mobility. So your flexibility, totally. not just of thinking, but also, you know, the body as well. But but th those are the five key tenets. And a lot of people just don't even think about the sleep part, the stress management part, or the, the flexibility part. So I'm really glad you mentioned those two. Very important. It's maybe it's of a certain age, but I'm just like, yeah, I got to, I got to, Focus on this. <laughs> it's important. I, 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 th I think at our age, because I'm I'm right there with you. You know, we begin to really realize as we start to yeah. lose stuff. Okay, this is I don't want to lose this. This is really important, and that's why I need to focus on this. So we do have a little bit of the 
the age of the school of hard knocks of life of really beginning to realize, you know, well, what's really key. impressive is your ability to kind of take advantage of these things with just a little bit of intention. The dividends are huge. Uh, they, so they are huge, especially at our age. When, when you look at someone like yourself who, who practices this versus somebody mm -hmm. your same age, who's not, I mean, again, we're of a certain age where you can look at one guy and say, oh, he's still pretty youthful and vigorous. And the other guy like, <laughs> dude's old, right? Yeah, yeah. It really does make a big difference. It does. It does. Wonderful. All right. Well, look, Lachman, um, thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. Really look forward yeah. to having you back on the channel whenever you want to come, especially if you're your indicators are oh. really beginning to blink. Turning point directly ahead. Please come on the channel. I will do. I'll, I'll reach out. Thank you. All right. This has been wonderful, brother. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Well, all right. Well, now's the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the financial advisory firms endorsed by Thoughtful Money, uh, to react to what Lachman had to say uh, and also talk about anything that's going on in the markets right now since they were on last week. I'm joined as usual by lead partners, John Lodra and Mike Preston. Um, John, we'll start with you this week. Um, so love to hear what you thought about Lachman. I mean, I guess there's a lot of stuff you guys probably are pretty simpatico on. Um, but I guess like him, uh, do you see signs that we may be at a turning point here that maybe the market doesn't see during the current, you know, everything's awesome resumption that we have going on in the markets now? Hello, Adam. Great to be with you again. And hello, everybody that's tuning in. We've been followers of Lachman for, for quite a while. Uh, he has uh, earned a very good reputation because his track record, his and his organization's track record is quite good, uh, certainly compared to uh, a tapestry of, of economic prognosticators out there that have really not a very good track record. And I think it, it lies in the very um, structure of how they do their work. And, and Lachman did a, a great job, I think, distinguishing the kind of discipline of their models versus perhaps the mainstream uh, typical economist models. He he like, he he contrasted most economists use what are probably called econometric models, where they're basically forecasts, they're predictions based upon inputs. And, and um, the classic saying, garbage in, garbage out, certainly applies there. But those models tend to extrapolate uh, these recent trends. Whereas his approach, his, his firm's approach is more about using leading indicators and, and the combinations in concert of these indicators, not one indicator as the classic silver bullet light switch on off, but a, a composite of indicators that when together flash certain signals have been historically robust predictors of turning points. And that I think is really important because it, it's it's the actual data speaking, not someone's ego, egotistical forecast of I know the future. And, and I think that really um, shines through in their work. And I think there's actually kind of a, 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 com a comparability with that kind of style with the way we manage money. Um, we're very obviously concerned about recessions and things like that because they can have dramatic impacts on the investment landscape. Uh, but we try not to anticipate um, what the markets will do. In fact, let me share a chart here just to make a point. Um, markets are actually very poor predictors of recessions. This here chart is a long-term chart of the S&P 500. And the gray areas are, are the recessions. And what you'll notice in most cases, markets peak right before a recession. In other words, re markets aren't very good predictors of uh, impending recessions. And in fact, recessions oftentimes aren't even uh, delineated until after the fact, post, post dated. Um, so, so that whole debate doesn't really play into our day-to-day -day money management, but it does certainly play into our um, kind of assessment of the risk environment and the degrees of belt and suspenders that um, that we think might be appropriate uh, in in tempering some of the market related signals. Um, hey, hey one... John, let, let me just interject for one sec because that's that chart is relevant to comments that have been made by past folks who recently appeared in this channel. Darius Dale being very notable amongst them, saying that you know historically markets have kind of gotten their wildest, oftentimes heading r right before a recession. I think the analogy we used is the party gets its most crazy right before the cops arrive, right? And I think your guys' is in Lachman's job when the market is really running hot is to say, okay, is, is this something that has sustainable momentum and this is just a bull up cycle in the market? Or is this one of those turning points where the herd is you know, stampeding and potentially stampede, about to stampede off a cliff? 
Yeah, and that speaks to a similarity between Locksman's approach. You know, we have a, a battery of indicators that we follow. Of course, we're always cognizant and concerned about valuations. They're not very good timing indicators, but these certainly are very robust indicators of what passive returns might be achieved by holding over, say, a 10-year period. And right now, that looks very horribly unkind, I, I will I will say, for the stock market anyways. Um but it's it's the indicators together. So our, our battery of indicators, maybe there's a, a future conversation item where we go in depth in our dashboard, but we have indicators that are uh, momentum trend falling type indicators. We have indicators that are um, sentiment or contrarian type indicators. And it's important to have a dashboard that looks at a lot of different things and kind of observes how they work in concert together to kind of historically explain things and, and what the future might hold. Um, and, you know, last year, if I could just give last year a little, you know, we, we were, I'd say in the camps that we, many, many folks that we thought a recession was probably pretty likely, um, given what the stew of factors. Um, but I, I will say that that wasn't what necessarily kept us rather defensive for most of the year. It was actually more the market, the very narrow aspect of the markets. Uh, I'm going to go on record to say it was more than just the mag seven that was up last year. We, we don't want to kind of contribute to that fallacy that was just seven stocks, but it was very narrow. And in fact, if you looked at the equal weighted S&P 500 through the end of October, which is the recent low that markets have have uh, shot higher off of, I think the S&P equal weight was down about 4% uh, year to date and small caps and, and other broader measures of the market were, were doing very well. Of course, they've rallied significantly. We actually did add some equity exposure and reduce some hedges. So we, we let the market guide us there. But uh, it was more the narrow market that kind of kept us on defense more so than this prediction of uh, recession um, in 2023. And we'll let the same kind of things guide us going forward. But we have to always be acknowledgement of uh, acknowledging of, of extreme valuations. We are in the, the rarest of rare valuations on metrics that matter. And that just speaks to, you know, tempering the the credence you put into these uh, indicators, uh, especially if they're they're spotty, you know, um, some indicators are in the short term here very concerning, kind of over, overbought type things. Although those have, have moderated pretty pretty dramatically in recent days, um, but we're we're going to let the the markets guide us, but but still not lose sight of the bigger picture here. And if recession happens, which uh, we we I think we totally agree with Locksman that this part, market is priced for per perfection. The standoff between market expectations of rate cuts and what the Fed themselves has has communicated, we think it's an epic battle yet to play out. And um, I, I tend to agree with uh, Locksman. I think probably eight months ago, I shared that same chart, uh, our own version of the same chart showing the three episodic bubbles or, or spikes in inflation in the 70s. This battle is likely not over uh, in inflation. He spoke to to wage pressures being you know very sticky and possibly a, a um, a, an impetus for a, a a turn higher in inflation at just the wrong time in terms of what the market's expectations. Mm -hmm. are. All right. Well, look, um, John, I, I just want to say yes to your earlier point. Um, maybe next time, at least sometime soon, let's actually on this channel, on this weekly you know time with you, let's walk through your dashboard. I think folks would really be interested in seeing what you guys at, at New Harbor look at most closely in terms of your indicators. Yeah, and John, you know, as you said, uh, you know, the the two key th key things that I took away from the conversation with Lakshman was he basically was saying, you know, looking at the status quo, uh, he thinks that uh, the two uh, surprises that he could see happening this year in 2024 would be that um, there would be a downward surprise on economic growth versus current expectations that seem to be priced into the market, um, and similarly, like you just said. Uh, that inflation could be higher than the market's pricing for. And of course, we spent a lot of the discussion explaining his reasons why he thinks that. Um, so anyways, Mike, curious to hear, uh, you know, if there's anything else you want to add to uh, John's summary of, of what Lachman said. Um, and also, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I, I think you guys uh, sort of think similarly about those two risks, but, it, but if you think differently, let us know. Yeah, no, he, it was loud and clear. With Locksman, he said that uh, the risk to the downside uh, for growth is absolutely uh, front and center, and uh, he thinks that we're potentially at a cycle low in inflation, and that uh, there's risk to, to the upside for inflation. We would completely agree with that. And you know, he didn't talk a lot about valuations, and I know that we've been talking about valuations for a long time, many years. And John mentioned it earlier, but but markets are priced to more than perfection. We think we're late in the cycle. Uh, this market actually topped two years ago. 
a little over two years ago now, January 4th of 2022. And now we expect that that high will likely be taken out because our short-term indicators are still positive. We're starting to starting to see a broadening in small caps and in other sectors. It was pretty much the MAG7 up until October. We're starting to see a broadening out. And so that speaks to the ever-present risk of you know, one more upside blow off top. And that's what is likely to happen. And we have positioned for that. And now that's not to say that we've gone all in, but we have reduced hedges and we raised equity exposure to close to 40%, about 38% notionally. A lot of that has hedges on that because at any point, we believe that there's crash risk in this market. But very short term, if we had to make a guess, the signposts, if you will, uh, on the road are pointing to another blow off top here. So we came within 25 points of the high just uh, last week or so. I'd be surprised if we don't take that out sometime soon. It's only going to take one good update to do that. That could easily produce another blow off top of which you know, we will participate in that to some extent. Not 100% because we're not 100% in. And if we had to guess, and a lot of this is guessing, reading the tea leaves and looking at the indicators, the market will make some high, maybe even above 5,000 on the S&P, go a few hundred points higher from here. And we will do our best to catch that turn. But as Laxman said, the all of their work centers around cycles. But you can get really hurt if you get the turn wrong. And that's that's the really hard thing here. We're all trying to find out when that turn is. And nobody knows. Absolutely nobody knows. So you really have to position yourself ahead of time. So we're doing our best so that we don't take on much water. Uh, the boat doesn't take on much water if we have a downside shock. Uh, we've got puts in place and things like that that will that will severely limit our exposure. You can never say we don't have any risk because there's always some uh, deductible down to those hedges. But we think that uh, we're positioned properly for that for that possibility. There's hey, a number can of I other... chime in on that just for a sec, Mike? Because mm -hmm. um, sure. this just underscores a key strength of your firm, and it's one of the reasons why you know thoughtful money brings you guys on the program week after week. You know, again, as I like to say, you know, we have you guys, we have a Lance on the show to serve as models, to show people how a good professional financial advisor thinks, reacts, you know, processes what's going on in the market in real time, how they craft a strategy around it. Um, I think one of the, the talents of your firm is your, your risk management um, and particularly how you guys, you know, structure your portfolios, particularly using options at times uh, as hedges and ways to protect downside risk you know not options can be used very um, speculatively as well you guys don't really do that you, you're much more using them to to manage risk and as i mentioned you know i've, I've been uh cramming for this securities exam so i've been having to you know refresh my knowledge of you know stops and uh option strategies and all that type of stuff so it's, it's very very fresh in my mind um, but I think the type of market environment we seem to be in right now seems to be particularly well suited for approaches like yours, because, you know, right now the animal spirits are kind of running. So the question is kind of like how how hot, how high, how long is this market going to keep you know running to the upside for? And if you decide to participate in that, you're putting yourself at the risk of the, the market really getting way too ahead of its skis and, and having some sort of, you know, uh, surprise correction in there um, for, for the majority of folks. So, you know, if you're going to play it, a really good way to play it is to have these downward defensive positions in place so that if the market all of a sudden does go into reverse, you know, you've got these things that light up that help protect the downside risk. So I just really want to underscore this because I think I'm sure a lot of viewers are listening to folks like, you know, Darius Dale, Michael Howe, some of the other folks are on the program who are saying, I think the market's going to be real hot through through Q1. Even Felix Zuloff, who believes that too, even though he thinks there's going to be a big correction after that. You know, the huge question for an, an investor is, is like, well, all right, well, how do I play this without getting killed when the reversal happens? So I just want to underscore that the strategy you're talking about, Mike, is a really good one to consider, which is if I'm going to play, let me put these safeguards in place so that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not caught flat footed if the market reverses. Yeah. And everything that you do has to be measured against Treasury bills. Right. I mean, Treasury bills are still yielding 5 percent. So I would say for most people out there that are doing it themselves, 
if you don't want to worry too much, just reduce exposure dramatically. You know, even even one hundred percent. Go to treasury bills and sit and wait. What happens? Uh, sit and wait and see what happens. I want to show a quick chart of the S and P. I share it often, just to really maybe go through thirty seconds of what the hedge means. Here is a chart of the S and P five hundred on a weekly basis, almost three years. Right up here. Uh, back in the 22 high, this was about 25 points higher than this recent swing high. But this market has been on a tear since October when we had the words from Fed Chow, uh, uh, Chairman Powell. And we became concerned about an upside blow off back here a couple of months ago. Because of that, we added some in the money calls on the equal weighted S&P because we also noticed that the equal weighted S&P was starting to, to participate in the party. That was a first. So we added some in the money calls. Um, we had some puts on 15% notional of the account down at 4,100. And that's basically if we get a crash, it takes 15% of our exposure off the table immediately. Now, there's the deductible between the current price and that, and that floor or that insurance. So we're always very cognizant about where, the, where that floor is. With this recent move higher, we moved that deductible up to or that floor up to 4,500. So this strength, which we participated some in, gave us the ability to move that insurance up because that insurance gets cheaper and cheaper as the market moves higher. Now, on this weekly chart, you can see that we had a one down week. We, had, we had essentially had nine or 10 up weeks, one down week last week, and we're working on an up week this week. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we see a big move maybe to a new high this week or next, and we could even get that blow off that we're talking about here. If we get a very vertical blow off, we will make some gains and we'll be able to move that hedge up even further. And we're always looking at sectors to see which ones are participating the most. Those are the ones that we're allocated in, but we're constantly moving these hedges around. We have some other hedges on our other positions. We're selling short call options on a number of other, other positions to hedge partially and to bring income in. The options are a great tool that we think helps us help our clients enjoy the ride a little bit better because we don't know what the path is. I would close by going to the monthly chart and saying that there's no guarantee of this, but the valuations, and some of the models that are put out by many people that we respect, uh, probably primarily John Hussman, GMO in Boston, and others, say that valuations should be below 2,000, you know, maybe down here to generate 10% annual returns, down at the 16 to 1,800 level. Now, will that actually happen? I don't know. Seeing that we're in a fourth turning and a lot of your viewers know what that is, it's likely as we climax and we go into an economic crisis, maybe as confidence in the Fed is lost, the market might come all the way back down here. We don't rely on that to happen to be successful. So having said that, though, we don't know if we, we get a blow off you know, up to five or six thousand. Who knows? And so that's what can really be dangerous for people. Like people can get sucked in. Um they can buy all the way down, et cetera. Our tools with options in particular help us navigate that better and hopefully have a successful path. Great. Hey, Mike, do me a favor. Go back to the weekly chart just for one sec there. Sure. Because <laughs> um, again, Maybe I just sure. want to point out one, one thing about your strategy here, which is um, you talked about how you, you, know, you put your hedges in place, right? Um, so you like, 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 Back in October, you when it, the or the market started bouncing there and going up, right? You you started, you you put hedges in at some level there, right? But as the market continues to rise, it gives you the opportunity to raise those hedges, right? And so this is akin to like the high, you know, climbing a ladder with a safety net, right? The safety net doesn't have to stay in one place the whole time. So as you get higher and higher up on the ladder, you can raise the safety net so that you know. Kind of no matter what height you potentially fall from, you can you can have a safety net that's close to you to catch you pretty early on, so you don't have to fall that far, right? So that's, that's right. a big part of what you guys are doing, which is as your trade is successful, you get to kind of participate more in it by raising those hedges, <laughs> uh, which you know lets you hopefully protect a fair amount of the gains you've got, and. Uh, you know, continue to minimize as time goes on the potential for a fall. And look, I don't want to give the impression that that the hedges you guys are using are 100% correction. I don't know, maybe they are in certain cases, but usually it's some percentage of the position, right, Mike? That's correct. Right now, it's about 15% notional value of an account. So 
I earlier said that we're around 38% or so in stocks. This reduces it effectively to 23% in a crash. You know, and so you you still have to pay the deductible between the current price and the floor, but it's one way to automatically reduce your exposure in a crash. Now we'd still have 23% on board even after this floor was breached in a crash, but that other 23% has other hedges involved. Now those aren't perfect hedges either, and they all have deductibles. You know, I estimate if we had something like a 30% crash, you know, if we went down to down to here, let's say, low 3000s. A 30% crash may, may cause us to lose 5 or 6% in that case. So we have to be willing to take, we have to be willing to take that risk. I don't think that's what's likely, but we wouldn't rule it out because this market's been so crazy and so historically out of the norm. We could just have a crash and then we would give up a few percent. It's more likely that we roll over and start to move down and we would have the ability to adjust. But absolutely, you have to be thinking about a crash all the time. 4,100 is where our previous hedge was. That's this line here. And after this move up, we moved it up to 4,500. If we get a blow off move to 5,000 or 5,500, we'll move that line up again. You know, and so we don't know when the turn is and we don't try to predict. And uh, I think Laxman also said it was very difficult to predict the turn. Mike, I'll, I'll make one one comment if you could leave this chart up. Because uh, sure. that analogy of, of a safety net is, is absolutely perfect. And in fact, um, Mike, I don't know if you mentioned it, but we had originally 4,500 strikes. Correct. Uh, were much of the decline from July to October. And because of that decline, those ended up in what we call in the money. Essentially, our clients were, for that part of their portfolio, safely in the net. And when we reached those near the lows of, of uh, late October, and as we saw things starting to, uh, to improve, that was the fortitude for us to essentially get our clients back on the ladder and move that net lower. Booking, booking some profits in those hedges at the, at, the, at the time. So it's a really vividly appropriate analogy, I think, Adam, the one you used there. So thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, look, John, let's come back to you real quick. Mike, you can take that chart down. Um, so, uh, John, I know you had a, a, a chart you showed me before we hopped on air here, which basically is showing these market cycles in correlation between stocks and bonds. Um, and that could be that could be very interesting here, especially given that Lachman thinks that inflation, you know, may continue to persist from here. Yeah, it's a, I think it is timely and, and appropriate. Um, this is a chart. I need to give credit. This uh, Julian Brid Bridgden, I think his name is, uh, put this up on Twitter. So I apologize to Julian. I don't have a reference here, but and this this is similar to some some other charts I've seen. Basically, you can look at the correlation between stocks and bonds, and. Um, you know, basically highly correlated things move together and negatively correlated things move move negatively. Right. And, and, and sorry to interject, but as a capital manager in general, you want them to be negatively correlated, you know, so as your stocks aren't doing well, your bonds are providing protective balance, right? About this buzzword called diversification that so much of the financial industry is is in pursuit of, frankly, with dogmatic models. If you think about the modern portfolio theory model, it implicitly assumes that there is a negative correlation between stocks and bonds, that when stocks are going down, bonds go up and vice versa. But during certain cycles of market history, that actually doesn't hold. Just so happens for much of uh, the period from, say, the late 90s through you know basically the last 20 years, that that correlation has been somewhat negative, right? So that that you know those two asset classes that most people are invested in predominantly, if not entirely, did provide some inherent diversification, but you go right. back. To and sorry, and this is why 2022 was such a rough year for investors really? because both parts of the portfolio performed horribly, your stocks and your bonds did, right? Absolutely. And if, if you go back to the eighties and, and the, the last, and it would be interesting to see this back in the seventies. So frankly, I think the correlation was actually even more positive in the seventies because you had both stocks and bonds do really badly, especially inflation adjusted uh, in, in the in the face of that inflation. If we are indeed in a cycle that's more inflationary, not necessarily always inflationary, but as Loxman talked, a very cyclical thing. Inflation doesn't sit at one point. The anomaly was the inflation sitting very low for the last 20 years in, in, in the uh, repercussion of two major bubbles. That probably is behind us. We're probably going to see a, a an environment like the 70s where it's a on and off kind of persistent fight with inflation. And that's where classic 
allocations to stocks and bonds may run into very disappointing results. What is the antidote to that? Things like commodities, real assets, but also hedged equities like we just talked about. The hedging effectively changes the correlation. It, it changes the behavior of what otherwise would be a very volatile stock allocation. So we think it's very timely and we can't know the, certain, the future for certain, but uh, we, we feel like our toolkit is well prepared if that's the kind of scenario that plays out here. Got it. And, and just because this that relationship seems to flip between errors of inflation versus errors of deflation, again, I just want to underscore, Tom will tell if he's right or not, but but Lakshman is saying, look, if if history uh, and you know the, the correlations that we've seen in the past continue to hold, um, inflation is likely to be more elevated going forward from here. Um, and so if that is true, then we're likely to stay in this era of inflation in this era of positive correlation between stocks and bonds, meaning that diversification may not work as well as it has in the past. That's certainly a possibility. And we're, uh, we're, we're prepared for that. If, if that's the scenario that plays out. Okay. All right. Well, Mike, we got to start wrapping up here. Um, I know you had one other chart uh, that you wanted to put up here. I believe it was showing the relationship between gold and the gold miners. Um, why don't you talk about that one? Because, you know, gold is, is you know, kind of churning sideways right now, but it's still pretty elevated. And if the markets continue running from here, um, hopefully that, be you know, it seems to be igniting a lot of the, the parts of the market that were slow to react through all of last year. Like, like John mentioned, how the equal weight S&P finally started catching a bid near the end of last year. Um, could we be near a point here where the, the miners start playing catch up? I hope so, Adam. Uh, I really hope so. T Tavi Costa put this out today on Twitter at Crestcat. It's a nice chart. And it kind of shows the long, unfortunate suffering that um, gold mining bulls have lived through over the last 20 something years. This is a long term chart. And it shows the miners to gold ratio. Now, I'd start by saying that we're very positive on gold. Gold right now is $2,024 per ounce on the spot market. And so it's hanging out there above 2000. I've showed on this on this channel many times the long-term chart of gold itself. It's an, it's a really good, nice looking chart with a very long base, triple top in the 2100 area over the last couple of years that we, we don't think will hold. When gold goes, when and if gold goes up through 2100 and stays there for a few days, we should start to see some notice being taken about the miners. Now, the miners have gone through a lot of problems in the last 10 years. There's some fundamental reasons for some of this. But this is very extreme, and it won't last forever. And you know, in his tweet, Tavi basically says, you know, what's going to make this break this downtrend? If this downtrend breaks and we start to see a move in miners, it could be explosive. And I know that we've been saying that a long time. And but the you know the sentiment in this in this sector is completely be beaten down. The price to earnings ratios are very low, you know, high single digits. Expectations are not great, and so if we get that breakthrough on gold, and I think we really could see some catch up. We, we are bullish on gold. That's really where we start this thesis. But just a small reversion towards uh, towards uh, on par performance with gold versus severe underperformance could make quite an explosive move happen. And the timing is difficult, I'll, I'll fully admit, because you know, look at, you're looking at 10 years here where underperformance persisted. But you know, when this moves, it's gonna be good for people that own some miners. That's why it's in our portfolio. We have hedged part of our position. Uh, it's been a long wait, but we're hoping that that move comes soon and it should come when gold breaks through that 2100 level that we mentioned. Okay, and I, I don't. I don't want to give the expectation. Bring that chart up again, just for one sec, Mike. Okay. I, I don't necessarily want to sort of sell the expectation that, like, oh, there's going to be this event where this thing just, you know, moonshots, and and maybe it does. Who knows, right? Um, but you can see that this process is one that's taken a long time, right? But you can kind of divide this chart into two trajectories. Um, you know, from the beginning of the chart, say to the the mid twenty teens. You know, it was going down at about a forty-five degree angle, but since mm -hmm. then it is flatlined, right? right? And so the question could be, you know, is this thing something that's going to be like an inverted parabola, right? Where eventually you 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 bottom out, and one could maybe make the argument that that that's where we are right now is is near the end of the bottoming out process, and then maybe start a grind, a secular grind higher. 
who knows, we'll be tracking on this program. It is highly likely going to take a good long while and, and not you know, change completely overnight. Um, but if you have a longer term outlook here, you know, you could look at a chart like this and say, hey, this is probably not a bad entry point where a lot of the risk has been bled out, um, at least in terms of this ratio, right? So that as long as gold holds in there, the longer the status quo continues, you finish the trough and then you start coming up the other side. It's a long base, Adam. You know, the, the, the last 10 years is a long base. And the longer the base, the, the bigger the move when it eventually happens. And that's what's tough is that... Um, most of the world is, is kind of not in the sector. They will jump in if we get that breakout and then it could move quickly, which is why we hold a position there. And yes, I don't want to set expectations either that it's going to happen tomorrow, but I think that you've got to have your position in place and expectation for that move if you're bullish on gold, which we are. Yeah. And I will note too, you know, a few of the folks I've interviewed just in the past week uh, have reiterated um, that they like gold. Lachman actually being one of them. Um, Stephanie Pomboy, <clears throat> just uh, two interviews ago, I think she was saying like it wouldn't shock her to see, you know, gold get to 2400 this year. Um, i trying to remember who I talked with a week or so ago. Um, not going to pull it. Um, no, I think actually maybe it was Zuhoff. This was a couple of weeks ago where I asked him what he thought gold would do in 2024. He said, he said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not crazy like those, you know, gold bugs. Um, so I don't think it's going to like go incredibly crazy, but I could see it getting to 2,800. And I was thinking like, well, okay, well, that's, that's still like a 40% increase in a single year. <laughs> yeah, that's not too bad. So anyways, yeah. no guarantees on all that, but there's lots of smart people that think gold, you know, this could be a really good year for gold. All right. Well, look, in, in wrapping up, um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes and folks, one, one announcement you may want to stick around to hear. Um, but first, before we get there, if you enjoyed the conversation with Lakshman, would like to see him come back on the channel, especially when his uh, cycle indicators are telling him the turning point is indeed here, um, please vote for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, I want to remind folks, and this is the part you want to listen to, um, that uh, the conference, Thoughtful Money Conference, we've actually now locked in a date. Uh, it is going to be Saturday March 16th. Um, I just got Lacey Hunt's confirmation that he will indeed be keynoting that, this one again. For those of you that have seen uh, Lacey's uh, just master classes uh, that he offers uh, at these conferences, uh, you know what I'm talking about, about uh, how valuable that is. Um, for those that haven't seen it yet, I've had many people say that just the Lacey section alone, which is the first of many, is totally worth the price of the conference uh, in itself. Um, so I will um, have a URL up hopefully in a week or so, folks, to direct you to to start signing up for this conference. But it's a little bit over two months away. I just want you to get that, you know, put on your mental calendars there. Um, and then uh, a reminder that I've got a sub stack that I publish a lot of information to for free every week about what's going on here at Thoughtful Money. Um, but um, if you are a premium subscriber to that sub stack, uh, you will be getting a additional discount to the conference. So as we always do, we, we try to get folks uh, the lowest prices to the conferences. So we start with an early bird price. We give people a generous amount of time to try to get a, a pretty substantial price discount versus full price for the conference. Um, we're talking somewhere like 30 plus or more percent discount. Um, but if you are a premium subscriber to the Substack, you get an additional discount on top of that. I'll have the actual numbers for you hopefully in a week or two uh, when we officially kick off the marketing for it. But I just want to let folks know that so that if, you know, for all the other reasons to sign up for the premium subscription, including uh, my Adam's notes, you know, clip note summary of, of, of all the interviews we do, including the one with Lachman, um, it also sort of acts like a like a di discount card, almost like a Costco membership uh, on anything that we do that that uh, like a, an event that costs money, you'll get a good discount on top of that. All right. So um, wrapping things up here, John, since you started, I'll let you have the last word. Um, any parting bits of advice here for um, the conscientious, concerned investor just trying to navigate these these currently challenging markets? Well, just um, just keep an open mind, keep an open eye. Um... Uh, don't get too caught up in the day-to-day -day headlines because they can be infuriatingly, um, and I'll use the example of, of the Bitcoin announcement uh, of, of an ETF getting approved. Uh, it was a hack of the uh, SEC web. <laughs> in the span of uh, minutes, there was uh, you know, all-out chaos on, on the news, right? But but no, but it's important to, to really not lose sight of the bigger picture. 
Uh, we've already spoken, the short term can provide some, some really interesting opportunities to clip some meaningful returns, but don't put all your eggs in, 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 in uh, service to those short term indicators because the bigger picture, certainly in the stock market right now, is very unkind from a from a valuation standpoint, and uh, like we like we uh, often say, our clients don't retire for one year; they retire hopefully for 20, 30, 40 years or more, and and that's you know the 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 devastation that a big decline can 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 cause in that pursuit is is just uh, you know it can't be underestimated. All right, well said, and that builds off of Lachman's parting bits of advice about remaining flexible. So yeah, that's what you're saying is, is, hey, remain flexible given all the curveballs that come along here, but don't put yourself in position where you can lose catastrophically. Um, it's just not worth the risk. Um, all right, folks, we'll look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, folks, too, um, the most recent interview I did before this with, with, it was with John Rubino. Uh, if you've still got some stamina, that would be a great one to watch following this one. I'll put up a link to it right here. John and Mike, guys, thanks for another great week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Adam. We love being here every week and appreciate it. See you soon. Goodbye now, Adam. Thanks.